Hi there, my name is Renee Hobbs. And I'm Kristen Hokinson. And welcome to Unit 1, Why Copyright Clarity Matters. Today we're going to uh, share a few goals for this session. The first one is to get you to really appreciate why educators depend on the use of copyrighted material from mass media, popular culture, and digital media within their digital learning environment. I know in the classrooms that I work in, Renee, uh, many teachers like to be able to connect to their students with um, those mass media and pop culture resources. Those are copyrighted, and we're going to talk about some different ways that teachers are using that within their work. Uh, another thing we're going to do in this session is learn about four different ways that students and teachers are using copyrighted materials in school because uh, students and teachers are using copyrighted materials for different purposes and that's important to understanding copyright and fair use. Yeah, as a result of um, using them, teachers have certain attitudes towards copyright. Um, some of them are downright scary, and I think today we're going to look at some of those attitudes and how it really has reflected a culture of confusion in the education community. That's right, and this uh, initiative is designed to clear away some of that copyright confusion. And to do that, we have to understand how the various so-called educational use guidelines have actually interfered with an understanding of the scope and limitations of copyright law. So let's begin. Great. So the work that we're sharing to you today comes from the Media Education Lab, which is my research lab at the University of Rhode Island's Harrington School of Communication and Media, where Kristen is an affiliate faculty member. Uh, you can learn more about our work at www.mediaeducationlab.com forward slash copyright. And that will be listed in the resources on this page as well. Nice. So this project that we're talking about, our copyright project, was initiated in 2007 with a grant from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation and it resulted in the publication of the Code of Best Practices in Fair Use for Media Literacy Education with our partners at the Center for Social Media at American University. So first we need to talk a little bit about way, ways that students and teachers are using copyrighted materials in their creative and academic ways. There are four ways that we'd like to showcase. There's probably more than four in, oh, absolutely. in the real world, but four, four that we think are important for us to recognize. The first is illustration and excerpting. That is, when students and teachers are making, uh, composing, or creating, they use bits of other people's creative material. We've always uses, used quotes or excerpts in our academic writing, right, where we quote uh, a, a, or make an excerpt from a, a limited amount of someone else's work. And we do that when we're using images uh, in our own material. We will take an image and we will use it to illustrate or to add value to some original material that we're creating. And I think that's where a little bit of that confusion comes in because we're not exactly sure when we go to find an image what that source should be or where we should go to find that imagery. Um, a second piece, and it kind of is very much connected in terms of using other uh, materials, is in digital storytelling. Um, you know, where I worked in a one-to-one -one laptop high school, I always said to teachers, it's not enough to give uh, high school students a laptop and then give them the same old research paper because they will just go and cut and paste. So how can we get them to take that material and actually turn it into a story? Uh, it's a little bit more challenging when you ask students to perhaps create a video or in this instance um, use something like South Park uh, to tell a story based on your learning of Darfur. And, and I think this is a great example. It's called Genocide Lost in Translation. We'll leave this link in the course as well, which leads us right into our fourth example, right? Because it's a digital storytelling piece, or third example. It's a digital storytelling piece. Yep, and so a third way that uh, teachers and students may use copyrighted materials is to actually engage in critical analysis. If you're in a social studies class and you're learning about news and current events, you're probably going to use an article from the New York Times or from The Economist or from the local newspaper, and there you're using uh, copyrighted material, but your purpose is to build critical reading comprehension skills and critical analysis skills. In this uh, visual example here, we have a student who's learning about advertising and the strategies used in advertising that are persuasive. And she's writing a little bit about what she's learning about persuasion, and she's analyzing a clip from a uh, soap commercial. Yeah, my daughter was actually uh, asked to do that in her English class uh, last year in fifth grade, wow. um, where they were looking at the different techniques that advertisers use in order to be persuasive so that they could be persuasive in their own writing. There you go. So 
the final way. Yeah, and I love this example. So um, this is an example of students doing remix, um, and we're going to provide you with some links and example. But you can see here them actually doing a search up where they are going to remix and pull together um, uh, different examples and searches where um, you might use an image from here and a piece of music from here or maybe a um, uh, clip from a video in order to, to make a point or, or mash them together. And this is a real popular thing on YouTube these days is can I take a song and kind of mash it up with other songs to make a point or to make a statement or perhaps even I've seen teachers do if you had to write the soundtrack for Romeo and Juliet, what songs from today would you put on that playlist or that, uh, that, that, that cassette tape. So, so teachers and students are using four different kinds of strategies, instructional strategies, that make use of copyrighted material. Illustration and excerpting, digital storytelling, critical analysis, and remix. These, one of the reasons why we're interested in copyright uh, clarity is that we want teachers to understand under what conditions can you use copyrighted material in your own uh, instructional practices. And I think that's where it makes it really uh, interesting, Renee, because we want our users uh, to be to be able to do that. And technology makes it so easy, right? We can search for something, we can copy it, we can paste it, um, we can mash it up, we can mix it around. But at the same time, yeah, at the same time, owners are asserting their rights to control and limit and restrict and charge high fees and generally create a climate of fear. I think all of us have experienced a sense of uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt about what are our, what's the scope of our rights and responsibilities under the law. So one of the things that we tried to do as part of our research project uh, in, with the social, uh, Center for Social Media was to try to understand the scope of teachers' understanding of copyright and fair use. So we conducted 50 in-depth interviews with educators in K-12 and higher education set settings. These are educators who do use copyrighted materials for media literacy education. And in a report we hope you read called The Cost of Copyright Confusion for Media Literacy, we were able to identify three common trends. Yeah, and it was interesting because I saw teachers throughout my work um, as an instructional coach and as a professional development uh, specialist in all of these areas, right? Teachers um, will do one of three things. They either would not ever sign up for this course because everything they do is educational. And if they learn something about copyright, um, then they might have to change their practice. We call these folks the see no evil. Um, and they just really don't want to hear anything. They don't want to know anything. They're doing it for educational purpose. And, um, and they, they believe that whatever they use for whatever purpose is, is okay. So some teachers just choose to remain ignorant. Another set of teachers are teachers we call close the door teachers. These are teachers who uh, close the, who go into their classroom, close the door, and do whatever they want with copyrighted materials, and encourage their students to do whatever they want. With and I think they materials. genuinely they're doing this, um, and they close the door not because they are doing whatever they want, but they really want to do right by their students. So mm -hmm. if they're if they're reading Romeo and Juliet. Um, they think to have the students be able to compare different versions of the video or movie versions from the 60s and 80s and 90s and today um, with the actual literature is going to help to make those connections. Right. Where this gets really challenging is now our classrooms are so open to the world. We've got Canvas and Blackboard and all, all kinds of other learning management systems and, and teachers aren't quite sure what to do in that type of, of, of environment. Got it. And tell us about the third category. Oh, wow, category, Renee. This Kristen. is the category in which I <laughs> fell when I first learned about um, this work and, um, and it really changed the, the way I operated. These were the folks that we call the hyper-comply. They were aware of a certain set of rules and guidelines, and we're going to talk about that. And they felt that as long as you were abiding by the rules, the 10, the 30 second, 10 percent, uh, a portion of a... Uh, of a collection of images or perhaps a certain percentage of a poem that you were falling within the rules and as long as you followed those rules then you could use that much of copyrighted material. One thing we learned in our research was sometimes hyper-compliant teachers were far more restrictive with their students than they were themselves creating a very interesting kind of um, uh, do what I say, not what I do phenomenon. Mm -hmm. All three of these strategies we had we discovered interfere with teachers using digital resources to promote innovation and in learning. So these coping strategies, while 
a way a way that teachers manage with their their own level of understanding of the law actually have been interfering with innovation and we discovered that a big source of the problem was teachers understanding of the educational use guidelines yeah and y'all know what those are right the agreement for guidelines copy not-for-profit educational institutions the fair use guidelines for educational multimedia the educational um, guidelines for educational use of, of music they are the things that you can hang over your copy machine right we know the examples absolutely and I think it's really important to realize that these uh, guidelines are not the law they are negotiated agreements between media companies and educational groups. Nowhere in the law is there a chart that has what you can do and what you can't do. But teachers like this kind of chart, right, because it's easy to assess. And it's easy to say, as long as you're using 30 seconds of music, we know that you are within those guidelines. And I think what was interesting as I delved into work is sometimes my students were better at um, – fair use analysis, and we're going to talk about that in, in a future unit, but they, they needed 34 seconds of a popular song to make their point and were willing to forgo the, the amount on the rubric. Um, so as I learned more about this, I realized that that, that really is a, a reasoning process, not, not this simple checklist, right? They're confusing and they're not the law. So if you ever see a simple checklist, you're already going to know it's not the law. We were powerfully uh, moved by uh, uh, the reasoning and analysis of um, Dr. Kenneth Cruz. He's a uh, legal scholar, uh, the head of the copyright, uh, formerly the head of the copyright office for Columbia University. In a highly influential law review article in 2001, uh, Kenneth Cruz did an analysis of the educational use guidelines um, and, and, and the level of confusion that has built up around them over the last 20 years. He wrote in this article that the documents created by these negotiated agreements give them the appearance of positive law, but these qualities are merely illusory, and consequently the guidelines have had a seriously detrimental effect. They interfere with an actual understanding of the law and erode confidence in the law as created by Congress and the courts. And what stands out to me about this, Renee, is this was back in 2001. This was before the social media movement, and the, the time where creating something to put on your Facebook page or uh, documenting material within YouTube was, uh, was, was even a vision um, in society. And so I think it's just gotten more confusing. That's right. So, so while we understand that the educational use guidelines may have been well-meaning, they actually now are getting in the way of understanding the law itself. And so in this course, we're happy to report that our job is to create copyright clarity so that you understand the law as it was actually written. So, so, so far, here's what we've accomplished in this session. Yeah, we wanted to make sure that you understood that um, pop culture is something that we're using, right? We want you to appreciate your, your ability to be able to use that. We also think that it's really important to understand the different ways that students and teachers are using copyrighted material in school. Mm -hmm. So that we can look at those attitudes and, and start to unravel a little bit of that copyright confusion throughout the, the next few units. One of the things that's important to realize is that copyright confusion has actually come from a misinterpretation of the so-called educational use guidelines as teachers perceived those guidelines to actually represent the law. In the next unit, we're going to understand what the purpose of copyright is, what the law actually empowers us to do, and what it limits us to do. And we think that that's going to help create some copyright clarity. We'll see you in the next session, right? Yeah, so please take a look at the activities and resources that are listed below. Um, work through the remainder of this unit, and we'll catch you in unit two. See you later. Bye.